Hello, good evening, friends. Uh, and I'm right, I can call you friends because I recognize so many of the names in the chat already. Hello, good evening. How are you all? <laughs> Everybody well there? Oh, that yes, was your cue, Rupert. Yes, good to there already. Hmm? Pardon? That was your cue, by the way, Rupert. That was my cue. Yeah. Hey, I'm good at missing cues. <laughs> uh, yes, indeed. Hope you're all well. Uh, and uh, I hope you're getting better weather than me. In sunny south of France, it's been absolutely disgusting for the last week. Well, by the law of averages, seeing as we've got visitors from all over the world, by the looks of it, it should uh, pan out pretty well, I think. Yeah. Well, yes, the, the forecast for the next week is actually rather nice. So, uh... Yeah. So good evening to you all. Won't mention you all by name. Too many to, to mention by name, but you know you know who you are, the usual suspect, and a few um, a few names I don't recognise. So if you're new to the show, uh, new to this, uh, please do uh, leave a comment telling us who you are and uh, and where you hail from. Uh, it would be really really yeah. good to know. We've got a. Well, I, I, I like what Patrick said here. Pa Patrick's just said hello. Uh, all in every time zone, and yeah, quite right. There's uh, people. I think, are, are I think you'll find that's. Pretty, I think you'll find that's Patricia. Uh, do you know what? I do need new glasses. I do yes, apologise, Patricia. But... <laughs> <laughs> okay. Well, I hope we haven't started as we mean to go on. Because uh, is that no, going to help? Bode well, does it? Uh, no, it doesn't. Because there's a lot of interesting questions have have come up tonight. Uh, um, yes, fascinating stuff. We've got questions about Stonehenge. Well, you know, why wouldn't you? Uh, got questions amazingly about uh, Ukraine. And there's something that, uh, apart from what's going on at the moment, um, until recently we didn't know much about. And when you hear, you know, about the prehistory of Ukraine, if you didn't know about it before, you'll probably have your socks uh, knocked off. Mm. I've got questions about Thornborough henges uh, and all sorts. Interesting thing about the flavour of the questions tonight, I think particularly they had, well, I'll speak for myself, they had me sort of, uh, well, should we say um, uh, cramming for my exam tonight? <laughs> <laughs> Um, there's there's been a, it's a little, little bit more work because you 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 know you know we do have that uh, um, imposter syndrome thing going on. Uh, we don't know everything, <laughs> and like I've said before, the wonderful questions that you pose us have us you know go into areas that we probably haven't yeah. been to before and uh, an answer. I, I think the the most frustrating thing is I don't know what it's like for you folks, but. Uh, my memory is, <laughs> you know, it, I have to do something over and over and over for it to really stick in my head. And yeah. so there's all sorts of stuff where, because, you know, we read a ridiculous amount, trying to absorb as much information as possible. And then something comes up that, well, you know, you've read it. But yeah. do you remember it? No, you don't. So, you know, we know where to go and look for it, to read up on it again. But can, will it stay in there? No. Let's let's see. No. Let's find out. Hopefully there's not too much <laughs> umming and ahhing and scrabbling about and waffling. Uh, I'll just acknowledge a few things before we move on and actually start uh, watching questions. Dorman's made it. Excellent. Good to see you, Dorman. Hello, Thank Dorman. you very much indeed. Oh, yeah, Sibylla's here. Um, Kelly Murphy says, hello from South Africa. Hi there, Kelly. Uh, Jennifer's with her. Uh, Andy um, McGeehan, hello from Coventry, just up the road from me. Half an hour's drive up the road from me. Um, yay. And Patricia again. And Dan Breen, Forest Lady. Yeah. Fabulous. Francis, Francis from Winterville. Wow. In Georgia. Georgia. Wow. Um, terrific. Shall we um, shall we answer a question? Yeah, go on then. I just think uh, when there's anything else to say before we start. I ooh, I think I think the one thing to acknowledge is that we have been a bit quiet of late. There have been strange things going on. Won't go there. It's you know they've it's we've not been firing on all cylinders for all sorts of reasons. 
Uh, good reasons. Well, not necessarily not good, good reasons, re but reasons. Um, yeah. But no normal service is now resumed. Let's put it that way. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> and, uh, Hopefully the output level will um, uh, will uh, kick off mm. again. So that's me in uh, question answering mode. Let's put the first up, Jimmy. The, you're there. I've seen you. Um, uh, you were one of the first in in the chat. So uh, uh, good on you for being here. And uh, I know you're listening. And um, yeah, for, you're, you've got the question first up because you were first. We do this in order that people posted them. By the way. Just so you know, mm. isn't it? so they're in no particular order except uh, the order in which people got off their asses and <laughs> wrote something. Yeah. In. Uh, Let's okay. come first. Um, now, the relationship between the mine site at Thornborough and Orion's mine, belt. Mine. It, pardon? The, the mine site. That's interesting. The main site. Did I say mine site? <laughs> you did. So, uh, oh please, Lord, let it not be one of those evenings. <laughs> uh, uh, main site at Thornborough and Orion's Belt is well established. Have any other sites been identified as maybe part of a larger range in the landscape? As uh, there are uh, in, uh, as in, are there any sites uh, identified as representing Beetle Jews or any other stars in the Orion constellation? Do we need to just? Price, um, um, uh, put this in context by saying anything about if people don't know about Thornborough and its relationship to Orion's belt. We can't assume everybody has that information in their heads. Okay, if you don't know, uh, Thornborough Henges is uh, it, it's a, a complex of three henges, um, which uh, uh, in um, uh, uh, North Yorkshire. In, uh, Yes, North Yorkshire, and uh, they are generally accepted to repre represent Orion's Belt, the constellation of Orion. Um, yeah, because in in plan form they do, you know. Uh, yes, uh, so accurate. they they echo the um, uh, the arrangement of the pyramids on the Giza plateau, um, and it's all that's that in itself. It's all very compelling. Um, what I did in uh, in response to Jimmy's question here was um, I actually got a high res photograph of Orion from NASA, and uh, and then I got uh, the area of on Google Earth, and I superimposed the uh, the photograph of Orion. Excuse me, put my phone on silent um, with um, you know, over the top of Google Earth. So I could position it exactly so that the hinges lined up with uh, 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 with Orion's belt. And the honest truth is that uh, it's not to say that there never was. We can't say that there never was because it's quite possible that sites used to be there and have long since been erased by farming. But there is nothing in the landscape now that uh, that corresponds with those photographs photographs with those stars certainly that i could find there is a castle which is fairly close to one but if you're going to say that the uh, the stars of orion's belt are pinpoint accurate in relation mm. to the henges then you you can't say that a, a castle that's just close can apply you know it's either accurate or it's not uh the one thing i didn't do and i probably should have done but i didn't think about it until it was too late uh was to actually follow the line of orion's belt so thornborough hinges i didn't follow them across the landscape to see if there was anything marking sirius because orion's belt does point uh, directly to Sirius. Uh, so I don't know. I will have a look. Maybe there's something there. But uh, certainly in relation to the other stars of uh, of Orion itself, no, I couldn't find anything else in the landscape at all. Um, yeah, I mean, uh, I think if anybody ha has done the work, you know, uh, whether or not you agree with um, some of his conclusions and uh, analyses, uh, but the actual fact of the matter. Why can't I find the pages that I'm looking for? This is bizarre. I think they're towards the back, that's why. Um, oh, yeah. 
there we go. I mean, whole pages of um, <clears throat> uh, virtual uh, alignments uh, using sky mapping software and uh, mm. uh, and, and stuff uh, has been done uh, by Jan Hardy. Or if anybody knows better and knows that his name is pronounced Jan Harding, uh, do let me know. But he will remain uh, Jan for the moment. Uh, the, Matt, in terms Matt of alignment... Says, uh, Matt says, would they really have been able to be that accurate, though, anyway? Mm, yeah, why not? Why not? Uh, you know, if, if, uh, if, if people in the Bronze Age were capable of constructing things as accurate as the pyramids... Yeah. Um, or any number of things that were astronomically aligned, then, yeah. yeah, I don't have any problem with that at all. Yeah, I mean, the interesting thing is that uh, Jan Harding points out is there are a couple of potential markers uh, away from the, uh, uh, the the alignment of the entrance to the middle henge, which may have been um, used as uh, long sites for getting it right. The other problem with, with uh, well, Orion certainly... Uh, it skims the horizon at certain times of the year. It's very difficult to, to pinpoint when the angle is so oblique, uh, which intersects with the Earth. Uh, it's very difficult to get an alignment in the first place anyway. because Well, the thinking, though, is that it, that it would have been timed with the rising of Orion, surely, because it does. It gets perfectly maybe. high enough. Um, yeah. Well, it's, it's, yeah. It's, but that's not what he reckons in here. So uh, that, that's the book. Um, if you want to chase it down somewhere on uh, Amazon or, or something, Cult, Religion and Pilgrimage, despite the title, it is all about uh, Thornborough Henges uh, and, um, uh, uh, and the surrounding uh, complex of uh, stuff. It, there is one alignment that he mentions that I wasn't aware of, and I don't know how accurate it is, but following the line out, straight out the uh, uh, north east entrance uh, of of the henge there is another henge about ooh, five miles away and if you follow that line through you get to uh, an arrangement of standing stones which is about 15 kilometers uh, 15 miles away called um, the devil uh, devil's arrows it's devil's arrows isn't it yes Contains but, the second uh, tallest standing stone in the UK. There you go. Second only to the mm. Rudston monolith. Uh, but does it relate to anything <clears throat> astronomically? Don't no. Know. no. Um, uh, uh, Martin, interestingly, hello, Martin. Uh, he said, did, uh, did, uh, did I try that on the nest of Brodgan? No, I didn't. I haven't, uh, um, I haven't uh, overlain anything of the nest of Brodgan um, astronomically. So... Uh, do you know something I don't know? Is there something I should be doing there? <laughs> <laughs> um, anyway, that's the best we can answer that, uh, Jimmy. Thanks for, for the question. Um, but, however, I'm, Jimmy, you also asked a supplementary question that was a kind of either or, but I'm actually going to uh, bring it up because it seems to have been coming up uh, in our t <laughs> timeline quite a lot recently, ever, um, especially... Take a deep breath, Mike. <laughs> um, yes, this question from Jimmy, why does nobody ever mention the 1958 total reconstruction of Stonehenge? Um, the short answer is, <laughs> to that is that there, were, there wasn't a total reconstruction of, uh, of Stonehenge. Um, that's why nobody it, mentions it that's why nobody <laughs> mentions it yes uh, and the other fact of the matter is there's nothing really to uh, talk about in my view anyway it, it's a, it's a non-starter for a, a point of of controversy but it seems that there are people you know who want to stir up stuff where there are none and let me uh, I, what I want to do, because I, I answered this question elsewhere in, um, uh, uh, because some, somebody else, some, somewhere else, pointed to this video that um, purports to say that uh, Stonehenge was completely rebuilt in, in the 1950s and the stones were moved and we can't rely on anything. It's a modern artifact. And, <laughs> um, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> it, it makes me blood boil a bit, that kind of thing, because it undermines faith 
it undermines faith in what people are actually doing and and uh, and up to. So I penned a reply to that, and I don't uh, forgive me for uh, sort of uh, reading it out. The reply that I wrote because it's the most concise way of of getting all the information to you now about what actually happened. So uh, here goes. I say there have been numerous times in the 20th century was when some stones have been straightened and or reset. For the most part, this has been for safety reasons. For example, in 1901, Stone 56, which is one of the trilithon uprights, uh, was rendered upright for fear that it was going to fall over. And it really was leaning over, you know, at an angle. And these are, some, these are the biggest stones. The trilithon uprights are the biggest stones at Stonehenge. Um, you know, there weren't many people visiting at that time, but there were some. So the chances of people being flattened at any point, uh, enough to get people to do anything about it. So it was rendered upright. Um, and there are photographs and illustrations to show that it was leaning over um, at any time up to this date. Not only photographs, but uh, uh, illustrations, um, you know, show the very same thing. Uh, later on, uh, stones six and seven, six and seven being part of the um, the outer Sarsen circle, still the big fellas, uh, were deemed unsafe and were straightened up, straightened up, not moved. They were straightened up in situ in uh, 1919, uh, 1920, and uh, the lintel between them, six and seven, was also replaced. Um, stones 29, 30, 1 and 2, that's the stones either side of the northeast um, uh, entrance uh, of the outer Sarsen circle, will also return to the vertical at the same time with their lintels in place. So nothing extracted from the ground, just put back upright so that they're in less danger of falling over. Now, in... Um, in 1797, uh, one of the huge central trilithons had collapsed, come, gone over completely. 1956, it was decided to re-erect these stones. Now, this is the only one, the one bit of major restoration of change that was ever mooted and, uh, and, and brought about. This is in the area of restoration, not uh, adjustment for safety, if you see what I mean. So... 19, uh, uh, so the work was carried out on that in 1958, which is, which is what the stuff you're referring to, uh, uh, Jimmy. Um, so this was towards the end of a very intensive archaeological excavation in the central area of the stones. The, the lead archaeologist on, on that was Richard Atkinson. And the restoration work was done under the supervision of him and the other two lead archaeologists at the site at the time, i.e. this wasn't work just done by the government. It was work under, you know, that was overseen by the uh, you know, uh, archaeologists who were on site at that time. And they were absolutely at pains to make sure that any stone that was removed to do work was put back in precisely the same uh, position uh, that it uh, that it left, and if you would seek out the reports from the examination, the stock socket holes and the chalk bedrock that the fallen triumphant originally stood in, you'll see how meticulous and thorough all concerned were in making sure that the stones were returned to their original positions. Whole enterprise extremely well documented at the time. No secrets about it. It was done under the gaze of the, the mainstream media and you know, the public were well aware of what was going on at the time. There was nothing to hide. Um, and now at the, at the time that needed um, some of the photographs that you'll see of this that people use to say, oh, it was completely removed and put back. No, it, uh, the stones weren't. In order for, for the big crane that had to go in there to manhandle the, the trilithons um, up and, and the lintel back into place, a couple of, um, and stone 22 in particular, from the outer circle were removed. Um, now, it looks empty, that side, if you, if you look at the photographs, but that side of the outer circle is empty anyway. You don't need to clear any stones to make that side of the circle look empty. Uh, the, other, the stuff around the other side 
uh, is still there. There's another photograph that shows the edge of the circle that makes it appear as if no stones are there. Well, no, there aren't any stones in that angle of photograph. <laughs> Even if you go to Stonehenge now, there aren't. So, you know, it's, it's sort of mind-bending stuff uh, when you look at the reality of what uh, occurred. The only other thing that was done, um, Stone 23 fell over in 1963. That was because Stone 23 was knocked slightly, so that was never removed, Stone 23. It was only its partner, 22, had to be moved, removed for the crane and all the rest of it. It got ja knocked slightly and uh, obviously was slightly dislodged and, and fell over in 63. Um, uh, that was re-erected in 1964, and stones 27, 28, 53, and 54 were straightened up at the same time. And that's it. There has been no complete restoration uh, of Stonehenge. The stones were not completely removed and put back, and any that were were meticulously put back where they were found. And if you look at any illustrations from down down the years, going right back, oh, I don't know, into the uh, 18th century, 17th uh, century, uh, you'll see that the, the current positions uh, um, are fairly identical to um, what they were then. Um, so uh, I hope that's helpful. It's something that gets me a bit uh, aerated about it, and I hope... <laughs> it see, what upsets said. me about it, Rupert, mm -hmm. is that... In the comments section of that particular video, there are so many disappointed people, so many people getting angry. You know, uh, uh, they've been they've been lied to. Things have been covered up. Uh, mm. uh, and it, it's not just not the case. And they, well, that's people... why conspiracy theorists can be such troublemakers. Yeah, but, you know, you only have to say something, and people believe it because people generally believe that people are being honest. Uh, so they believe, you know, they see something that they didn't know and they just believe it straight away. It's yeah. unbelievable how much utter rubbish is uh, is spoken all the time about things that, you know, it's, it's annoying. Yeah. Some yeah. people just like to tell some lies because it gets them attention. It's very mm. sad. Mm -hmm. um, so uh, I, I want to pick up on, uh, uh, on uh, Tim said, it, uh, interestingly... Oh, you've just popped off the screen. Uh, no, interestingly, uh, they had to use a crane in 1958 one. to rebuild. Yeah, it begs the question, how the heck did they build it in the first place? Oh, yes. <laughs> we better not go down that route now. But uh, well, to, except interestingly... That, uh, except that I, I will say again that, you know, that it, it, it's down to... Uh, we just have this attitude now because we have become profoundly lazy and because, you know, for the last couple of hundred years, we've had fantastic machinery to do jobs that we don't want to do or things that are too much like hard work. So now we look at things that are hard work and we can't imagine how people did it. Um, and, you know, to, to make a big, strong timber A-frame crane is, you know, that's something that people have been doing for thousands of years. So uh, uh, and and also I've uh, I've said this man's name so many times. Look up Wally Wallington on YouTube. Uh, he's uh, retired now. If he's still with us, I don't even know if he's still with us actually. But um, Wally Wallington was an engineer, and uh, he showed how just with basic engineering, clever thinking, but basic engineering. You can move uh, stones as big as any of those trilithons on your own. And he did it yeah. in his own yard. Um, just showed how you can move huge, you know, ridiculously heavy blocks all on your own. Sidebar trivia. Yes. Uh, the crane that lifted, that was used, was called the Brabazon. It was uh, borrowed from the local RAF uh, it was the only crane big enough to do the job that there was, was right. available, called the Brabazon because it, it was a crane that had been designed specifically to be able to lift the uh, Brabazon bomber, which was oh. a, under, <laughs> which was one of the aircraft that the RAF, RAF were using at the time. I Good think trivia. It a, this is real trivia, isn't it? The Brabazon <laughs> uh, aircraft, which was a blooming big bugger uh, so they had a special crane if they ever got 
jammed on the runway or stuff like that. And that's what they got from the yeah, local RAF to help. Um, oh, and Lazzy, good question. What's the oldest image of Stonehenge? And you've probably seen that one. Um, good old Geoffrey. Good old Geoffrey of Monmouth. But the, 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 the oldest figurative uh, image, and I can't bring it because uh, my camera won't focus. Oops, sorry. Figurative pretty image. Pretty good. And that is from 1574 um, by a Dutch traveller called Lucas de Heer. Pretty good, huh? Wonderful 15, stuff. yeah. Yeah. So... Okay, let's move on. Let's move on. Thank you for the question, Jimmy. I hope it didn't sound like too much of a rant just uh, answering <laughs> it to you, but it is what it is. Okay. Um, Ingvald, now hold on to your hats. Ingvald. Love your name, Ingvald. Can I have it, please? <laughs> Ingvald Bot. It's a great name. Yeah. Um, what can you tell us about the ancient history of Ukraine, the Kukutani Yamnaya boundary, and its significance to modern Europe? Does Ukraine have any history worth preserving? Where to <laughs> flip in start? Yeah, well, we, we could do a whole program all on this. I think it is very important to bear in mind that, you know, we talk about Ukraine because of everything that's going on at the moment madness. Um, but bear in mind that, you know, the point in prehistory, or, you know, this band of prehistory that we're talking about, you know, that a lot of the country boundaries, they probably even hadn't been conceived, let alone fought oh, over. Lord, um, not at all. Uh, you know, we, we don't really know when many of these boundaries were, were, were set in place. The archaeology of that region is is so rich it's breathtaking and uh, um yeah if it gives you an idea of the period mike you've got some photographs haven't you should, should we just oh um... uh yes let me um get on to that hold on a second um, i was just looking for something else because i needed to um let's bring this up Is that the right one? Yeah, so that's the area we're talking about. Um, uh, usefully on this map, you can see Kiev uh, uh, up there. So this uh, Kukutani uh, uh, Tripilian uh, culture, it's called, it's, it's a full name, occupied this uh, uh, area. Yeah. Yeah. Um, so it's not, uh, it, it, it covers, broadly speaking, it's half of current U Ukraine, isn't it? Um, yeah, because part probably. of it stretches um, into Romania there uh, at, the, at the bottom edge. So, yeah, it, it doesn't stretch as far over as it uh, quite as it does now. Um, but bearing in mind that that's, that's based on uh, archaeological findings, and so we don't know for sure where that boundary would really lie. But, you know, yeah, take. yeah for, for sure. Um, but te first of all, what are the dates that we're talking about, Rupert? Well, it's uh, you're, you're, we're talking about three thousand. I mean, in fact, some, what's the what's the oldest? Because some of it is ridiculously old. Oh, um, uh, yeah. Um, the uh, the I, I think at least four thousand five hundred, probably getting on for five thousand uh, uh, BC. But I think the main when it really starts. Yeah, yeah, you're talking a little bit later than that for the main. Uh, uh, yeah. the main activity, aren't you? But um, uh, the, the quality of artefacts that were coming out of that part of the world for thousands and thousands of years is utterly staggering. Um, mm. So, yeah. you know, it's so, in, you know, you asking the question, uh, does Ukraine have any uh, prehistory worth conserving? <laughs> Heavens uh, above. It's, oh, it's, yeah. Let me just, and the other aspect of uh, the the culture, I'll just move our uh, thing out of the way, uh, is in the middle. You know, the the well, towards the back end of the period that we call uh, that the, they were flourishing, uh, is that the 
unprecedented and hard to think of anything uh, contemporary with this or that came after it. But these enormous villages, proto-cities or proto-towns uh, that they had. Uh, this other map, uh, Handley, of course, we've got uh, Kiev up there, so we've got some kind of anchor mm. to visualise uh, this. But in the, um, in the central area there, you know, higher area between the Dnieper and the um, uh, Blug uh, River deltas there, or whatever you call them, these enormous um, sort of proto-cities, and I've got an image, I think, of, yeah, of mm. a, an artist's impression. Uh, and each one of those, you know, these aren't rude dwellings. These are beautifully constructed, timber-framed, square uh, houses. Each one of these dots on here, uh, square uh, dwellings uh, with uh, pitched roofs. They look absolutely fantastic. And they've got a, a, um, a, a consistent kind of design, no matter how big they were. This is an illustration of one of the biggest ones. But th these outside dots here that you see round about the outside of there, that's the back end of the outer houses. So you've got these houses with their windows completely circumnavigating navigating the outside, face facing outwards, and then concentric rings on the inside with radial pathways through. But also they, they have this um, area in the middle, the open area in the middle, and nobody really knows you know, how that was... Uh, utilized. Uh, and, and, but to get, give an idea of some of the culture, some of the material culture, I think these are just awesome. I would have one, if, any one if of you these saw any in of those, a heartbeat. In, in, if you saw any of those in a modern ceramics gallery, oh, yeah. uh, you, you yeah. wouldn't question it at all. Yeah. Are just they going, staggering. how much? How much? Yeah. Take my money? Yeah. yeah. Um, I mean, for the age, it's just staggering. And just to, to reiterate, so at the time that these were being produced, there wasn't much going in on in Britain. Not that we know of. You know, there weren't no, ever, we even leaving all. settlements behind. You know, Star Car was probably happening a bit, though that was towards <laughs> the end of it. And uh, you know what, people... what's sad about it though is that we. It may well be the case that Britain had the finest carpenters that the world has ever seen. And, they were turning, and, and that they were turning these astonishing bowls out of beech wood and everything else. And there's nothing to show for it. Show Nobody for thinks it. it's just a bunch of numpties. Oh, dear. Know. Yeah. But <laughs> nothing. No, You don't get pottery a approaching this until, yeah. until Habitat opened in 1960. <laughs> <laughs> well, do you seriously? Yeah. Uh, no, I'm, I'm, I'm joking, you know, but I'm trying to make the point. Um, and uh, yeah, yeah, and, and people were only just arriving from uh, Brittany, from the continent, when it, into Britain. Farming was only just being introduced into Britain, you know, uh, at, at this time. Is there anything else? Uh, and of course, oh, look, you see, we've got artifacts made of copper here, would you believe? Hmm. You know, and this is how long before we even begin to see it? Copper comes into Britain, what, uh, 2005 BC, if we're lucky? Uh, yes. Uh, or, yeah, or, although it has to be said, though, that, it, you know, we're back to that thing of, you know, why are there no copper artifacts? Because oh, they were all melted know. down to, re to use uh, to make bronze. Uh, yeah, yeah. Okay. So, you know, so we, we don't really know, but... Um, uh, you know that and tin as well. There was probably a lot, an awful lot of tin uh, stuff yeah. being used yeah. prior to that. But again, melted down uh, with the copper to to make bronze. Um, yeah, yeah. Now, one of the reasons that, that oh, oh I, I didn't want to show some of the figurines as well, which are great. Uh, but anyway, I won't because it'll go on too long. But I will <laughs> just say that something uh, that some correlation, some uh, resonances have, have been tried to be drawn between what went on at the end uh, of the Kukutene uh, Triplian um, culture and what's happening now. Uh, there's a, uh, a writer, uh, a historian called um, Maria Gimbutas, who uh, asserted that the main culture of uh, the... 
Kublajenik was um, uh, egalitarian, and not only that, uh, because of, uh, of the figurines that have, uh, have come out, were, they were mother goddess uh, worshippers. And the Kukutani culture came to an end because of marauders from uh, the east coming in, the Kurgan from, from the east, from the steppe. Uh, uh, and um, it, it was a violent overthrow. I think that is contested, though, and uh, it seems, although the genetics help, you know, uh, affirm that there was an uh, infiltration from the East, it's much more likely that it was uh, one of assimilation rather than conquest. I think that's the best way of putting it. So one's well, mm -hmm. got to be careful if, if, if there are any correlations being drawn between then and now. Uh, got to be careful. Though <laughs> it helps to know, I mean, it's it's it helps, you know. The, the, the answer to the question is, is <laughs> yes, <laughs> Ukraine's got an, a staggering prehistory. A staggering prehistory. This yeah. culture was was uh, uh, was comparable to anything in Mesota Mesopotamia had to offer, mm. and it, there it is in Central Europe. Amazing, amazing. Mm. Yeah, it's just it's a sad fact that uh, humans are just the most warmongering uh, species ever. And so it doesn't matter, you know, just pick a point on the map. People have fought there. Um, uh, so I, I think, you know, it's 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 dangerous to look at any particular spot and say that's history repeating itself. Mm. That's just humans being Oh, because you're Ridiculous. bringing your microphone a bit uh, closer. You, your level, I think, has dropped off a bit. Am I fading away? Uh, you're fine. You're good. That's it. Yeah, cool. Um, uh, yeah, at which point uh, we're doing okay. We're doing okay. Shall we move on to uh, another yeah, question? On. Okay. Uh, thanks, uh, Ingvald, for, uh, for that. Um, who oh. knew? <laughs> uh, Bard. Bard Madsen, uh, I would like to know why the seven dodos of Gebekli Tepe are ignored. It is, it is as if uh, no one knows that the most recent and dangerous meteor stream appears to emanate from the seven avian host of stars, and it was built right after the mysterious, abrupt Pleistocene-Holocene change. Each year when crossing the torrid stream, the skies would be alive with meteor showers that would look like groups of snakes undulating downward through the layers of atmosphere. Well, uh, yeah, I don't know if you're there, Bard, but you're probably not going to like the answer. <laughs> <laughs> We're going to tell well, it all like because, it is. It? Yeah. Because, uh, because um, you know, we've... Um, uh, we've made good contact with uh, with Lee Claire at uh, at Gebekli Tepe. Uh, uh, so uh, we sent that question to him because the honest truth is that neither Michael nor myself. Well, we read that question and we thought seven dodos. Is there something <laughs> that we don't know Sorry, about? Shouldn't at Gebekli, you know, and yeah. no, but it's you know again um, we we don't presume ever. That, uh, that that we know so uh, so we thought that was something that we were missing so we sent the question to lee yeah and uh, um yeah well, we thought we, that we got a reply uh, and lee for those that don't know is the archaeologist in charge of uh, excavations because, he's uh, he's coordinator of the entire dig over there uh, um at uh, and that's the wrong screen i oh, know that's uh, it. um yeah, so, and this uh, was Lee's answer uh, to that question because we gave it to him in full. Would you like to read it, please, Rupert? Uh, he, he says, there are no dodos at Quebecli Tepe. Uh, we have depictions of vultures and water birds, but definitely no dodos or penguins. This question is likely going in the direction of some sort of outer-worldly connection of Quebecli Tepe with the Pacific region, i.e. Easter Island. Uh, to concerning the meteor streams, certainly we cannot rule out that the Gebekli Tepe people observed the night skies. However, there is no archaeological evidence that the monumental buildings were ever dedicated observatories. Don't forget, they were roofed over and probably had no direct line of sight to the sky. 
Three, just because the viewer thinks that the meteor streams resemble snakes, this does not mean that the Gebekli Tepe people had the same cultural associations. And perhaps some food for thought, why should they have focused their attention solely on the night sky? What about associations with the surrounding landscape? If we accept that these people practiced some form of animism, what about the roles of the mountains, the hills, the plains, and all the animals? Perhaps the buildings were oriented as they were in order to form a relation with particular physical places or natural landmarks. Four, also, why does he or she refer to the abrupt Pleistocene Holocene transition as mysterious? It's one of many cold, warm cycles that have occurred on Earth over millions of years. Just by labelling it mysterious seems like an attempt to give, to give Gebekli Tepe some special place in that mystery in order to evoke esoteric narratives. There you go. Boom. Uh, we, we knew that we could rely on Lee to be succinct. Um, mm. uh, and Is there anything more to uh, say? Uh, uh, no, not really. I, I think that in, in fairness to, um, uh, to uh, Bard's uh, question, in fairness to Bard, you know, that it, it's, it, it is a good illustration of why it is so careful not to try to impose our modern day thinking onto uh, people in the distant past, because you know we have no idea about their um, uh, their associations with the, the lives that they were living. Mm. Uh, you know, in the same way that partly through social media, you know, that we share memes today, where uh, where some of us, uh, you know, we we can make a reference to each other uh, using. Uh, even the words from a film, you know, a line from a film. Um, and and everybody knows what everybody means. Um, uh, you know, and, and there's no way, you know, you take take that out of context and it means nothing. So applying that sort of rationale to people of 5,000 years ago, you have no idea what was going on in their worlds. Uh, and, a, and a good point there is when Lee was telling us about uh, some of the uh, the carved pillars at Gebekli Tepe, that uh, they clearly illustrate something very, very specific. And so mm. where you have a figure that has a fox on it, uh, you know, that, that we try to interpret that in whatever way, but we need to be careful because from all the other engravings and carvings at Gebekli Tepe, it, you, could, uh, you could make the analogy that if you were illustrating Red Riding Hood, Little Red Riding Hood, uh, then, you know, we today who share that narrative, we would understand that. Mm. Uh, but take it out of context and it means nothing. So, you know, it's the same sort of thing, if you see what I'm talking about. But mm -hmm. I just thought, uh, yeah, Lee, he certainly answered that uh, succinctly. There are no dodos at Gebekli Tepe. Uh, yeah. Uh, I'll just address um, uh, Bubba, um, Bubba's question there. Um, da, 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 da. It says, trust no one, not even the, even the head digger of an archaeology site. Well, <laughs> well then who Why? do you trust? You know? Um, that's the whole, whole point about having academics that, uh, that do the work and spend their lives doing the work, is that at least you have basic facts to, to work with. And they're always at the cutting edge, always finding new stuff. So, you know, maybe things mm. and opinions change from time to time. Uh, maybe we'll disagree with their opinions from time to time if we see mm. that they've, that, you know, if in, you know, you, you, you'll know, Bubba, if, if you stick around. We're not frightened to um, uh, at, at all uh, take issue with some of the garbage that comes out uh, of some of our good friends' mouths. Yeah. What is, in our opinion, you know, yeah. is inexplicable. Uh, and it's uh, not, but it's not to do with the work that they do. Uh, it, it's to, to yeah. just choosing likelihoods of what is on the ground there. Uh, and uh, uh, I, I want to the, the up, trust, but, uh, use uh, that care, tr careful about using that trust word. That's all I say. Yeah, but I'll also pick up uh, 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 
Baba, you, you, you say modern day thinking is the same today as it was 12,000 years ago. Um, certainly in terms of the human experience, you're broadly right. But, mm. but you, you also need to bear in mind that, um, that what we share culturally has roots in in very specific things you know whether mm. you take uh, you know religion for example so christianity all over the world or um or you know or uh, or islam or you pick any of the main religions they're based in stories mm. that were constructed historically comparatively recently mm. that we would all recognize those uh narratives today but go back 5,000 years, 10,000 years, and you wouldn't. The narrative would be different. There might be similarities, but they would be different. Uh, and there's also the, uh, the uncomfortable um, aspect of language. The words that we use actually have a profound influence on our thinking. And there's been some very, very fascinating research uh, done about language and the way things are perceived by people and there was a Russian I wish I could remember her name a Russian uh, linguist who did some brilliant research on this and she showed for example how um, if you take uh, Spanish as opposed to uh, English or German uh, that uh, that in it, so you talk about in a court of law, for example, if you talk, if you're a witness to an accident, that it, the language in English we will say that uh, that the man crashed the car. Uh, you will say that the person did something to an object. In Spanish, you'll say that the, the that the car broke itself. You wouldn't say that the person did it. You'd say that the car drove in the car drove into the landscape uh, into the mm. lamppost. If you see what mm. I mean. Mm. Now, uh, in terms of uh, witness testimony, that clearly has an impact on what's going on in your head. You know, you're removing mm. the responsibility of the person from the uh, mm. from the equation. Uh, so, to say that thinking is the same, that, that might not be the best example in the world. But the thing is, I'm just saying that the words that we use have an influence on our thought processes and language. You've only got to go back. 400 years in England, certainly, 500 years, you would barely understand a word. Go back 700 years, you certainly wouldn't uh, understand what people talk, were talking about. And, uh, you know, the, the further you go back in time, because language changes so quickly, um, you know, even... <laughs> even today you know mm. we, we become grumpy old farts you know <laughs> when we talk about i remember when it was michael jackson wasn't it? when thing everything started to become wicked you know and it's like you know um uh, the old folks were going what, what, what are they talking about <laughs> which <laughs> old folks are you talking about now Rupert? yeah yeah yeah, yeah, yeah. or <laughs> yeah yeah, that wonderful line in Back to the Future when Marty says, uh, oh, man, that's heavy. And, uh, and Doc says, why do you keep saying heavy? Is there something wrong with gravity in your time? You know, yeah. um, anyway, Bubba's, uh, yeah. Bubba's operating out of a story that, uh, that scientists can't be trusted. So I don't think we're going to change his mind somehow. Mm, uh, not on this it's, call anyway. Uh, it's uh, I, if you if you don't trust scientists, then, then I don't do know trust? who on earth you <laughs> you're, you're going to trust, really. Yeah, yeah. Um, because the, the whole uh, the essence of science is to uncover the truth and uh, and increase your fact, you know, your your knowledge base. Um, it's not about making up stories. No, it might be no. about making up narratives. Uh, mo most, facts, I mean, most people but, in um, science would hang themselves rather than make stuff up. Yeah, you know, or or, yeah. or if they've or if they're found to be wrong, I mean, know oh, that of course there are egos involved, you know, and and stuff uh, does go wrong, and and some people mm. anyway. We're going down a weird sort of. It's uh, worth saying though. It's worth. It's saying, worth though, saying. You, yeah. You look what happens when a scientist has been found to have falsified information, which yeah, happens yeah. very very rarely. But when when it is uncovered that somebody has falsified information, they are pilloried by the uh, who uh, called sorry who Brandon called out Bilber as a troll he's not a troll so okay 
He's not, he's not, he's not a troll. He's just um, free to express his opinion, which is considered and, uh, you know, it's not just throwing stuff about, I hope, anyway. Uh, but I, I don't see evidence of uh, uh, us being trolled there. Thank you. Um, <laughs> yeah. But anyway, I think uh, it should move on. I don't want to get bogged down there. No, no, no. Uh, yeah. No, it's just clearing up. Uh, just check back, Bubba, on something you did say, that uh, you, it gave the impression that you meant all scientists or, and, and or all science. So uh, I apologise if uh, I misconstrued that. Okay. So many scientific papers have been pulled over. The... Can we move on, please, Bob? I don't want to be rude, but we've got a lot of actual prehistory questions to, to get through. Of course, a lot of scientific papers have been pulled over, but that's a small proportion of the massive amount of scientific papers that aren't pulled over. That's the purpose of science, that they get that if something's wrong in them, they do get pulled over. <laughs> that's, yeah. the whole, that's how it works. Okay, enough said. Uh, I will uh, move along. Where are we now? Thank you, Bud. I bet you didn't know that's where uh, that uh, question was going to lead us all. Okay. Um, oh, sorry. Didn't mean to do that. Toss Stones. How are you, Toss? The Venus of Wallendorf. Um, mm. Yes. Relating to the source of the stone. Are there, is there any more information, please? And would it have been partially carved on site? I think you mean S I T E, not S I G H T. Yeah. Um, so uh, tell us all about the Venus of Wallendorf, then, Rupert, <laughs> or what we uh, what well, we. Well, I, I have uh, I, I have my latest um, information on the Venus of Wallendorf. Uh, to my left. Um, and um, oh, I well, didn't prepare all... an image. I didn't prepare a um, a thing. Sorry, folks. Yeah. Uh, well, if you don't know, the, the Venus of Wallendorf is uh, it, it's a, a very famous uh, uh, carving. It's thirty thousand years old, and it is of the uh, the very rounded uh, female form, you know, normally associated with fertility goddess sort of uh, figurines. Uh, yeah. She has her I'm, I'm attempting this to drag it straight from Google into the screen, and I'm going to drop it now. Oh, good. well done. <gasps> it worked. Ta-da. Wow. <laughs> well done. <laughs> Excellent. Okay. Excellent. there. Um, um, so sorry. Um, it's tiny. It, it's it's tiny. It's only uh, sort of mm -hmm. uh, that kind of size. Um, and what's unusual about uh, the Venus of Willendorf is that normally they are made from bone or clay or you know that sort of substance. Mm -hmm. And uh, and this one, thirty thousand years old, is actually carved out of oolitic limestone. And uh, the uh, uh, the stone is not local to uh, to Wollendorf. Uh, it's uh, well, it's uh, Wollendorf is away. just it's just uh, Wollendorf itself is just south of Vienna in Austria, uh, and it was discovered and, in 1908. Uh, that's the only uh, that's the yeah. yeah, and and the stone itself came from it's it's not that far away. Is it 15 miles away, something like that? Oh no, is this it? the other side of the Alps? It came from. Oh, it? That's what they're oh, did reckoning. I get that wrong? Yes, you did. But so how far has it travelled then? Um, uh, oh Lord, I don't know. I don't think the paper actually uh, gives the number, so I didn't pick up on it. Uh, but it's several hundred miles, or a hundred. Is miles it several at least. hundred miles? Well, that's interesting because then you see you have to assume. No, you don't have to assume anything, assume anything. at all. Yeah. Um, but um, but my interpretation. Oh, here you go. I have found it. 730 kilometers. Oh, there you go. Like I say, I mean, the, the uh, what's the name of the place that they've reckoned it, it comes from? Um, Rupert? I'm, uh, <laughs> well, uh, what I don't want to do is sit here and read an entire paper, uh, while everybody's watching me being boring. Um, 
So uh, I will skirt over that and just say that uh, it's quite a long way away. Do you know what? You, uh, there's a lot of stuff uh, that's been in the news about it recently. So if you do want to follow well, that's, it up, that's, then, uh, you know, I think that's uh, Toss's yeah. whole point, really. Um, uh, the, the, I, I mean, if you're asking the question, um, would it have been carved on site? Well, you know, that's obviously unknowable. Um, uh my personal uh, guess would be that it was carved locally and and traveled that distance probably over generations mm. it was you know passed from hand to hand and ended up where it did mm. uh probably over a significant length of time um mm. Mm. i i wouldn't think that it uh, was partially carved in one location and then taken hundreds of miles away to be finished yeah, um, and the thing is, it's a sort of you've got to be careful when asking this kind of question because you've got to f figure out well how would I answer that question in the first place? Uh, <laughs> how how would you determine whether it had been carved on site or not? So there can there cannot be an answer to that question. No, uh, it could have been, might have been, and we've just got to pick and choose what we think is is most likely. And mm. uh, uh, be honest with you, I just want to pick out uh, Rupert just one second um, before we leave that. Um, you be entertaining while I'm still reading it. Sorry? You be entertaining while I'm still reading it. No, I was just going to quote, just to wrap it up, um, these two quotes from the paper. It says, okay. and by, by the way, it's the Sega di Alla, which is uh, in northern Italy. So you know, down the Austrian Alps and when it turns into the Italian Alps, the other side of that. So, so even if we cannot claim with absolute certainty, so they're not, you know, uh, being absolute about it, that the raw material of the Venus originates from a particular locality, the match between the Venus and Saga de, Sega de Alla in samples is almost perfect you know so the high confidence here and suggests a very high probability for the raw material to come from the south of the alps but then later on in the paper it says while this is the most likely result from our analysis it cannot be ruled out although based on a uh, lower statistical likelihood that the material or the crafted figurine could originate from the area of eastern ukraine Ukraine twice in, what, twice in one night, who would have thought? Wow. Which would indicate a long-term and long-distance diffusion of cultural artefacts over generations from the east to the west. In any event, our results suggest considerable mobility of Gravettian people, Gravettian culture, is, yeah, whatever, uh, at the time around 30,000 years ago. Mm. So I hope that helps. Uh, it's not exactly answering your, and there isn't any further news. That is the absolute up-to-date um, uh, thing. And I think the trick is to seek out the paper. Paper, it's freely available uh, online. Mm. How they worked out the um, the petrology of this particular oolitic limestone, uh, and ascertained that it was most likely from this particular. Uh, place. I mean, all the potential places are some distance from where the uh, figurine was found. Mm. That's, uh, so you've got to deal with that. It's not lo It couldn't be local. It's, it's got to have come from somewhere at some distance. But uh, uh, this is one of the more uh, distant possibilities, and it's, nevertheless, it seems to be the one. Oh, okay. Um, I, have we done that? I think we have. Okay. Well, let's get back to that screen. Oh, I can hear myself, Rupert, coming back. Oh, can you? Yeah. Have you got an open speakers? No. Okay. Um, were bentcop.biz, are you there? Were there cans or dons in the Pennines that were pulled to bits? And if the Dr. Gail Higginbottom surveyed the ridges, could she identify likely where the spots be they would identify likely spots where they would have been chosen for alignment. Uh, sorry, I didn't edit to your question there, Ben Cop. Um, um, 
Uh, a bit of context here. Why the question? Why, why do you think Benkop asked the question first off so people know where she's coming from? Uh, he? I don't know. Benkop, are you here? Uh, yes, um, it's, um, oh, heavens above, Kelly. Kelly, okay, yeah. Um, <clears throat> uh, <laughs> oh, there, you're there, you're there, Benkop. Okay, cool. <clears throat> don't hate um, us after this. <laughs> no. <laughs> Um, and no, well, because yeah, the, the obvious answer, I suppose, has got to be um, that well, there were probably loads, um, and the stone, uh, you know, and the stone. Well, I'm trying to get to the bottom on. of the reason that Bent Cop asked the question, so that it makes sense right. for when we answer it, if you see what I mean. Uh, and and what's the significance of Gail Higginbottom in all this? That, that, because not everybody will know. What you're asking me to explain yeah. the meaning of the re relevance of, of Gail Higginbottom. All right. <laughs> <laughs> Gail Higginbottom, wonderful woman. Uh, she has done some amazing research on uh, possible astronomical alignments with, um, uh, with prehistoric sites. And she's analysed how the landscape would have been used, might have been used, um, uh, so how natural so a, a valley for example might give you a natural sight line uh, to astronomical phenomena um, uh, and she has done some extremely compelling work uh, the uh, she in fact she was um, uh, she was on she gave a great talk on megalithomania last year uh, which is where we met, albeit virtually. Um, yeah, she does some very fascinating work. The honest truth is, um, uh, uh, Kelly, that we uh, we can't really answer that uh, question particularly. You'd have to ask Gail. Uh, uh, <laughs> yeah, uh, we, we, can, because, we can possibly... I mean, were, were, were there cans or dolmens in the Pennines... You know, how would we know? Most certainly. Oh, uh, yeah. How yeah. would we know if they'd been pulled to bits? We wouldn't know. Um, but uh, but it, you know, it, it is it's likely, I suppose, uh, as much as uh, as they would be anywhere else. Mm. Um, and uh, I, it's it's certainly a question that could be thrown to Gail, but I I wouldn't want to speak on her behalf. Yeah. Um, but I, but I think I think the the answer that Ben Cop wants is something that you know it's one of those questions that you have to give up because you can't know the answer. You you can't arrive at, at any kind of uh, conclusion. I mean, you, you, the reason you're asking Ben Cop is because uh, often dolmens and, and stuff in, in the landscape you can find uh, alignments um, you know wh whether or not that's down to coincidence whether or, or not is another question I entirely um, but you it sounds like you're wishing them to be there to further prove the fact that these were built in alignment with e with each other uh, or not and um, it's possible it's possible it, it, but we don't which know. is possible. Um, but mm. it, it, it sounds like you're, the the question is is unanswerable, and therefore you've got to let that bit of it go because it's a bit of confirmation that you can't have. <laughs> we, we have actually talked about um, uh, getting Gail on for an interview at some point. We might do that and yeah. uh, and toss that to her. Um, yeah. Yeah. yeah, we've also got an open invitation to go and visit her in uh, where she lives in northern Spain because she lives in a place where the archaeology is just phenomenal. Indeed. So, uh, yeah, yeah. Okay. Yeah, watch that space. Anyway, um, listen, I want to pick up before we move on. Yes. Thanks for the question, uh, Kelly. I, I, um, I want to pick up just on a comment because um, I, I feel duty bound. Bubba has uh, has made another comment um, uh, that I don't want to leave. Uh, 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 he she says if science archaeology is so trustworthy why are so many scientists archaeologists being kept out of so many key sites around the globe take egypt for example only if you tow the globalist line well the reality with egypt is uh, that egyptologists as a whole uh, do not want their boat rocked it's um, it's not about towing the line there are 
some brilliant scientists who have come up with data that completely contradicts the Egyptologist narrative and timeline. Robert Schock, predominantly, the, uh, the American geologist, who has proven beyond doubt that the time frame that is still given out uh, by Egyptologists uh, is completely wrong. And the thing is that when you say um, why are they kept out, it, the, the principal reason that people are kept out of, of sites in Egypt is because of, uh, what's his name? Zaf, um, yeah. Z oh, so, oh, God, I've seen your moment again. Zawe, Zawe. Uh, yeah. Um, so sorry. The, the thing is that uh, he he's the, the chief... Um, it's, so it's down to ego in his case, in this case. It's, it's, it's entirely very down much to ego. down to he, ego. He will yeah. not have anybody come in to take something away from him. It has to be his discovery. Um, and the only people he lets in are people who will uh, acquiesce and let him be hmm. a part hmm. of the discovery so that he's then the person that you see when any publicity is made. Hmm. Um, uh, so there are plenty of archaeologists around the world who uh, want to be giving you uh, a, a, the facts as they uncover them, hmm. but they're not allowed to because the egos won't let them. Hmm. Uh, you know, the true scientists in all of this want everybody to know the truth mm. it's the egos who so imagine for example um if you've written 20 books and your books say this and you make a lot of money every year uh on selling those books and then someone comes along and says well your books are wrong mate well clearly <laughs> that person doesn't want them publishing that information because it means suddenly nobody's going to be buying their books anymore and there's a lot of that that goes on with Zawi Hawass. Like, Thank uh, you, Jess. Like Egypt. Yeah. Sorry? Mm. Uh, Zawi Hawass. Zawas. Uh, Zaw yeah. Yes. Thank you. Should mm -hmm. remember his name. Um, yeah. Yeah. And, and you know, to, to, to be fair, uh, you, I, I think, you know, what can look from 60,000 feet like conspiracy is, in fact, human beings and one or two of them being dickheads, basically. Uh, Indeed. You know, Indeed. Ego in science, you know, accounts mm. for a lot as well. It, 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 I, and yeah, personality I I, 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 counts for a huge amount. Um, yeah. But it is it yeah. is down to the the human level. Um, you know, you've got to look at. Yeah. It, it, it's part of the uh, equation. It is yeah. um, some I, I, people are more persuasive than others. Uh, mm. I, I think I, I think another point, Bubba, is is also that if you really want to uh, to get a, a, a clearer sense of what the uh, the real archaeologists are doing, mm. then uh, completely avoid mainstream media. And uh, and if, so, if you see an article in the media, whether it's I, I don't know where where you're from, but whether it's, uh, you know, in Britain, if it's in the Daily Mail or, you know, whatever, that um, if you take those key things and do a Google search and go down that, that all those results until you see the, the university where the archaeologist is based, go to that and find the source paper that the archaeologist mm. has written yeah. because then you will get all the data that has been compiled, that the journalists might go, ah, that's boring, throw that away, we'll talk about the fancy bits. Yeah. Um, but it's the the true research that will give you a, a, a clear sense of what the archaeologists are actually doing yeah. and why sometimes it takes two years to publish a paper because there is mm. so much data to go through. Mm. Uh, uh, it, you know, it's um, archaeology more than I think any other discipline these days uh, has become an increasingly refined science where the uh, the technology at people's mm. disposal now that allows analysis on a level unprecedented Und really, undreamt of before yeah. um, that uh, the, what there's what they uh, the information that they're giving in their papers is uh, you know it, you do them a great disservice to say that they're not being honest they put yeah. so much work Mm. into uh, getting all the facts there so that people can read them. Yeah. 
Um, you know, so I'd say give them a go, but be very uh, suspicious about the journalists because the yeah. journalists are not necessarily so discerning. And to be fair, archaeology is a, is a very particular case, um, particularly uh, prehistoric archaeology, where there is no um, um, confirming written record of, of, of an idea. Um, mm. So a large part that, you, that, that we're getting so much data in archaeology now. Um, and but the part of the job of the archaeologist is not just to give us the data. It's also they also have it uh, uh, you know thrust upon them, or did they make it th this way themselves? But they have to deliver a story to us of some sort. And sometimes they get that story mm. wrong, um, mm. uh, and uh, or will simply disagree with, with each other. I mean, uh, mm. one of our friends, Tim Darvill. Uh, is one of the main archaeologists to do with Stonehenge, and he, he strongly disagrees with, you know, the other uh, for Mike Parker Pearson, for example, about the way things happened and what Stonehenge was for. Same data, um, but different ways of looking, and that, that's that's where the area where archaeology or uh, actually gets a bit bit grey and where we've got to make choices about what we, well, do we think that's likely or do we think that's mm. likely to, and often now mm. where we end up tells us much more about ourselves <laughs> what we yeah. end up believing tells us much more about mm. ourselves than mm. about anybody else or anything else so yeah. we've just got to be, be aware of that and that that really is a, a very good point mm. because mm. Uh, you know in, to be honest it's one of the reasons that Mike and I g generally avoid Egyptian archaeology like the plague because there, there is so much emotive nonsense around it that you can say something, you know, a new discovery in Egypt and the people who just want it to be like this, you, mm. you just get arguments online. And to be honest, we just don't have the time to be dealing with, you know, we're not going to get involved with arguments with people who just don't want to hear about a new discovery because it doesn't fit with their bordering on religious beliefs you know if you're going yeah. to make pre you know decisions on oh actually it's like this well then your mind is it, it's a religion if mm. it's not based on facts then it's just what you want it to be so anyway let's I'll move on uh, yeah. <laughs> uh okay cool david garcia have there been any new discoveries are you there david have there been any new discoveries on doggerland and another is oh Slipped another one there, didn't see that one coming. And another one is, how come the Wissants, is that how you pronounce it, Rupert? Yeah, Wissants, yeah. Uh, uh, other, otherwise I, known I, as I like European... question. Yeah, otherwise <laughs> known as European bison, survived into the present, whilst the aurochs did not. Uh, for the two being mm. large wild cattle, it seems kind of odd to me that both lived throughout Eurasia, presumably from Europe to Siberia. Is there any explanation how, of how it came to be? So yes, yeah, the two, it looks it looked on the surface of it. The two questions might be related, but let's should we deal with, with the Doggerland one first? You, you, you go Doggerland, yeah. Well, I don't think there have been any new uh, discoveries uh, on uh, Doggerland very recently. I think we're all waiting with bated breath uh, to hear from uh, Vince uh, Gaffney. Uh, about the results of his mapping of where the rivers uh, uh, on Doggerland may be because uh, the techniques that are being used to first to find those areas where uh, if there are settlements they're most likely to be, then to be able to drill down on those river banks to uh, extract the, um, what's, what's it called, the sedimentary DNA? that possibly yes. ex exists there uh, to find out where people were living and uh, and and what what they were up to. Um, yeah. Was something else? There was an exhibition somewhere uh, in the Netherlands, I think, August last year. I mean, there has been a heck of a lot of stuff dredged up, but I don't think anything game changing as far as Doggerland is concerned. Oh, I did dig out, if anybody wants to know where um, uh, Doggerland, what we're talking about with uh, Doggerland. Um, yeah, the... Um, 
area between what is now Britain and the Netherlands and Northwest Europe um, that used to be dry land. Um, but due to a tsunami and rising sea levels, uh, we now have the English Channel and the North Sea instead. <laughs> um, um, but stuff has has been dredged up since oh, early in the 20th century. Uh, uh, mm. to tell us that people were um, uh, living there, and quite a lot of them too. So um, I, I don't think there's anything more to be said really going down that avenue. There's a lot more to be said about Doggerland, obviously. But no, you go on mm. to Wissants and uh, uh, tell us about uh, Wissants yeah, and Bison. Wissants and all. Uh, well, this is just, you know, it, 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 it panders to my naturalist hat. Um, the, the, the thing about uh, the European Bison, if you want a piece of useless information, uh, Wissants, why are they not called European Bison? Uh, well, they are called European bison, but it's because wizants and aurochs both come from Old German, and bison comes from Latin, and uh, we tend to use more Latin than German, and that's why we call them European bison in England and probably wizants in different places. But um, the European bison, why did the bison not go extinct and aurochs did? Well, it's habitat-related more than anything else. Mm. Um, we think, we and think, yeah. the, the thing is that whilst they're um, uh, whilst they're both wild cattle, uh, aurochs were uh, creatures of the forest, really, whereas bison are creatures of the plains. Well, the the, the, the aurochs, it, it is believed. I mean, this is from isotope analysis of. I think we're going back to Stonehenge now. So some of the uh, uh, finds in that area, I think, probably particularly from Blick Mead. Ah, oh, that's it. It's right, Blick Mead. I'm not going to spend time explaining Blickmead, for those who don't know. It's near Stonehenge, um, but it's Mesolithic. And they were killing aurochs left, right and centre, let's say that. So there's enough aurochs bones mm. uh, for archaeologists mm. to be able to do the analysis. And mm. the isotope analysis tells them that aurochs tended to winter in the forests and then come out mm. in onto the uh, plains uh, in the winter, or was it the other way around? Oh, one or the other. <laughs> anyway, it, it, the point is <coughs> made. But yeah. the the uh, the the thing is that because of humans over the thousands of years causing deforestation wherever they went, uh, that uh, humans basically reduced aurochs habitat as they went, whilst increasing bison habitat at the same time. Uh, so essentially, that's uh, that it, it's a habitat-driven extinction. Yeah. That's if there my were interpretation, anyway. Yeah. You, 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 <laughs> that one. Just, I'm not going there. <laughs> <laughs> um, yeah. yeah. Also, because aurochs were... Um, were quite a lot bigger than the European bison. Mm. It's not a surprise that humans would have wanted to go and, you know, bring down one of those and you've got a lot of food for a lot of people. Um, so, I, yeah, they didn't help themselves, did they? Aurochs. <clears throat> mm. uh, no. Yeah. Wildflower says the last aurochs was killed in uh, 1627. Uh, yeah. That is correct. Yeah. Yeah. Um, which is quite sad, really. Uh, you know, it's. Can you imagine? Oh, it's tragic. <laughs> In fact, we've seen it so many times, haven't we? Um, yeah. Just the the last of a species. When you when you see, you know, the last white rhino and things like that, the last one gone, and another one, and another one. Yeah. Uh, species. I mean, yes, it's very depressing. We're a shocking species. Yeah. Um, yeah. Anyway, thank you, uh, David. Great question, yeah. by the way. Actually. Yeah. yeah. Um. Okay. Uh, Abby Sue, um, since we heard that the altar stone at Stonehenge is thought to have been brought from a sandstone outcrop in southeast Wales, I wonder if you've heard any more recent news about the exact um, location. Uh, Abby Sue, I, I don't know what your source of information, so I, I don't know if I've got any uh, update uh, to that. Sandscrow outcrop in southeast Wales. Southeast Wales, I can only assume that you're referring to the notion that there is an outcrop near Milford Haven. 
on the coast uh, there. And I think that's been a favoured site for the particular sandstone that the altar stone at Stan, uh, Stonehenge uh, is made up of. It, and the altar stone is a pretty big stone, isn't it? It's huge. One of the, but it is on. It's always been uh, mm. lying on the ground, in the ground, I should say. Uh, and it's collectively um, marked with the blue stone. Though it's not particularly. Uh, it, it isn't uh, a blue stone, because it's another stone that's come from a long uh, way away. Um, I've got a map actually that might help us with this. Hold on a second. You can you feel free to uh, talk, Rupert. We don't want images of Doggerland right now. Uh, is it this one? <laughs> it is. Here's one I made earlier. <laughs> <laughs> uh, those who know mm. recognise it. Uh, this is basically s the south of England. Oh look, there's London over there, and over there in the west with the Brecon Beacons National Park. That's South Wales. And uh, South um, West Wales over there. Oh, that now you see Milford Haven is South West. Um, yeah, I probably see where uh, uh, you you're coming from. So what we've got here, that uh, marker there, um, the pin marker is where Milford Haven is on the coast, which was a favoured site because of the possible coastal route for the delivery of the bluestones from. The star just above it there, which is where the Priscelli Hills are, where the uh, blue stones mm. actually come from. As far as I know, the favoured site at the moment is the star in the middle there, uh, which is this called the Senai uh, Formation, S-E-N-N-I. -N -N now, if you're marking that as South East Wales, then that would be uh, jive with what my understanding is at the moment. And again, this is not definitive, but the closest match seems to be there. And also, mm, could be on a route, you know, land route, down to mm -hmm. uh, Stonehenge, down there near Salisbury. Um, that, that's all I've got. Uh, I have to say, um, I'm reading um, Mike Pitt's uh, book at the moment. How to build Stonehenge. Um, uh, so, and I think he, when he was, this has just come out, and I think uh, he was at pains to keep this as up to date as he possibly could. Uh, so, I'm what my information I'm getting from this about the, the Senai formation. Bob Ixer and Richard Thingy, we should get on, you know, the, the petrologists responsible for a yeah. lot of this work that's yeah. pinpointing. Yeah. Where these in fact, that's, came from. Uh, uh, that's a uh, comment uh, 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 Barbara said, has anyone heard that in the 1500s Stonehenge was moved from Scotland to its location now? Um, uh, there, there have been stories that it came from no. all sorts of places, but the <laughs> petrology has been done and it is known for 100% certainty that it came f that the blue stones at Stonehenge yeah. uh, came from Wales. Yeah. Um, uh, and also, Bubba, um, uh, excavations have revealed that the Romans knew of uh, Stonehenge because they went there and they picnicked. The, the evidence is in the ground mm. of them having done that and of having yeah. chipped off bits and taken them home and, and stuff like that. So although yeah. the Romans never wrote about it, surprise, surprise, they were fully aware of it and visited it and yeah. knocked seven bells out of it. So, <laughs> Yeah. Yeah. So it was certainly in its current location uh, 2,000 years ago because mm. the Romans uh, had it as a day out. Yeah. Um. <laughs> <laughs> All right. Our pleasure, Bubba. Um, yeah. Uh, Bubba's from Texas, by the way. I don't know if you noticed that. Oh, okay. Cool. Well, yeah. thanks for joining us. What time is it for you? It's early in the day. Yeah. Uh, uh, okay. I think is that nearly... Our last question. No, two mm, more. No. Two more. Hold on to your hats. Um, did we answer that? We. Uh, I hope that was um, um, that was an acceptable answer, Abby Sue. Yeah. I hope so, Abby. Yes. Yeah, yeah. So, uh, Dale, how you doing, Dale? I think you're there. I've seen your name in the in the chat. Um, yeah. Has the whole area within the stones been explored with? Um, with below-ground sensors, uh, uh, geophys, I presume, 
uh, amongst others, you mean, to map out the position of timber posts at Stonehenge. Would the gravel need to be removed first? By the gravel, um, I, I don't know exactly which year uh, to protect the surface there, as visitor it was, numbers increased. It was the 60s, wasn't it? Um, yeah. It, it was the late 60s that because people walking all over the interior of Stonehenge was just turning it into a mud a bath, so they yeah. graveled it just to make it... Uh, yeah, yeah. Uh, ...to protect the archaeology underneath, basically. And you probably you probably have a point, actually, as far as, far as that's concerned. It may well interfere with geophys. I don't know. Don't... But, it uh, depends on the... It depends on the geophys. It wouldn't, it wouldn't mess with yeah. magnetometry. No, and magnetometry okay. has been done. Yeah. Secondly, have local farms been searched for possible missing stones that could be returned to Stonehenge? But let's deal more fully with the first part of the question... Um, first, uh, no. To my knowledge, the interior, uh, you know, uh, by the interior, I mean within the um, ring and bank and ditch. Actually, certainly not within the mm. um, uh, Sarsen Circle. I don't think it has been surveyed with uh, 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 with um, sub -pen ground penetrating devices. Um, the the thing is a, a large area of the inside has been um excavated so we've got direct knowledge of what's uh, what's there i can't remember there's a diagram somewhere that shows exactly how much but by no means all of it but a very large proportion of it has and going back to the first question tonight you know and uh, stone uh, 58 when that was extracted from the ground, that was one of the largest areas that they were able to excavate uh, at uh, a single time, that they were able to, to do at that time, revealing the pits and, uh, uh, and, and post holes that were, that were under there. So a large amount is known about what's under the surface at Stonehenge, but mm. not in the way that you're asking. I don't think no, well, Joe, all Joe that here mentions lidar, but uh, there, yeah. there, there, there are lidar um, results oh, yeah, yeah. Uh, of Stonehenge, and there's not really anything to be seen under the, the circle itself. Nothing shows yeah. up. Well, uh, lidar uh, isn't a ground penetrating technology, anyway, is it? Uh, well, it does show up an awful lot of features that. Uh, yes, yeah, so uh, it's not ground no penetrating. It doesn't show you stuff under the ground. Uh, no, no, but it's going to show surface features that res that are as a result of things underneath. Do you know what? Um, I think the only thing that would show you the results that you want to see in magnetometry, but I'm not yeah. sure that, that would work. Matt, I think uh, 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 no, you could tell us, Matt. He says GPR ground penetrating radar would penetrate, uh, and now your uh, comment has just skirted oh, interesting. off the screen. What uh, you were referring to Graham's out. comment. Um, so, uh, yeah, I, I'm not going to pretend that I know. Um, uh, but, I mean, so much work has been done that I would have thought that they would have twigged that by now. No, it's LIDAR is not ground penetrating. It bounces. That's the point about it. It, it, it uh, bounces off the surface, you know. <clears throat> so it does find all sorts of features that are completely invisible. Yes, but only uh, if the features are invisible to the naked eye on the surface. You know, we yes. wouldn't be able to see them, but by, you know, giving shadow and depth to the faintest of undulation in the uh, in the landscape, that's, it reveals stuff that m may be there. It would be, uh, but it's it not. It can't reveal pits, for example. Lidar can't reveal uh, pits. No. It, what would be interesting to do, an interesting exercise, would be to go through all the different aspects of geophys, yeah, and yeah. Uh, and see what each of them does specifically. Yeah. Um, uh, we in fact. We how how, how would how would we do the do clickbait that. for that though, Rupert? How would we what? How how would we manage the clickbait and the thumbnail to get for that one? <laughs> Yeah, ideas yeah, on tricky. a postcard there. <laughs> no, Gra Graham said. <laughs> uh, the, as the gravel has been fired, it can't be seen through. So this is exactly the sort of question we need to uh, mm -hmm. uh, answer. So, yeah, fascinating. All that said, 
all the area around Stonehenge massively uh, examined by uh, ground penetrating, by you know, subterranean. Uh, <laughs> yeah, Baba, you're right. Techniques. Absolutely, we do. Mm. <laughs> um, so yeah, uh, the uh, hidden landscape project, the Stonehenge hidden landscape project, Rupert. Yes, I thought you you had some stuff on it. Oh, um, no, you're bowling a googly at me there. Um, uh, if you're talking about the stuff uh, across the landscape as a whole, uh, then it's it's staggering, actually, yeah. how many timber posts. Now, I'm not talking about on the level of, say, palisaded enclosures. There are literally thousands of fence posts uh, across the Stonehenge landscape that can only have been enclosures of one sort or another. And it's very likely that they were pens for keeping animals in. You know, can't say that for certain, but they're mm. fence posts. They're not palisade posts, you know, these vast okay. timbers. They're just fence posts. And I, I think, I don't remember exactly, but it's between eight and 10,000 posts that they've uh, detected individually. Mm. Um, yeah. that's a lot of posts yeah uh, well there's an so awful lot been revealed by that uh, through LIDAR through um, mm. uh, geophears ground penetrating radar all that stuff oh not least of which of course was Vince's um, circle of pits around Durrington walls that's true too you know because yeah. you know, uh, yes. yeah no, it's going to be a while before stuff. we get the results on that lot but uh, oh isn't it just yeah. yes <laughs> but in, in answer to the the second part of your question dale would the gravel need to be removed for, no secondly have local farms been searched oh, for possible yeah. missing stones that could be returned to stonehenge the thing about the landscape in wiltshire is that the the farms apart from the fact that now it's all military nonsense anyway and there aren't any farm enclosures there at all yeah. um but uh but from a geological point of view, it's it's not remotely like uh, places in northern England, say Derbyshire, for example, or, or, or Yorkshire, or down in the south in, in yeah. Devon, where farm walls are made, they're all dry stone walls. Mm. Uh, they just, uh, they didn't do that in Wiltshire because the geology just didn't offer the, uh, oh, particularly the necessary the amount plain. of dry stone walling, yeah. really. Yeah. Um, so There aren't uh, many farms of that type at all in the no, area. Yeah. Um, uh, certainly, if any stones had been taken away on that level, you know, then they they would have been found. Uh, it's they were they were broken up. They were broken up by amulet hunters and talisman hunters and and taken off as souvenirs and all that kind of stuff. It's uh, it's amazing. Um, some of you might have seen we we did a a film about the Rollwright stones in Oxfordshire, and the King Stone, the outlier from the circle is a really weird shape uh, oh, yeah. you know that sort of cuts back in on itself and uh, uh, you know you'd look at that and think that oh they must have chosen that deliberately because it's such a magical shape but no you then look at illustrations of it um, over the last hundreds of years and uh, and and even in the last three or four hundred years I think, you can see how that stone has changed shape completely where travelers would just knock another piece of stone off to take away as a souvenir yeah. or a talisman. We don't know, but, mm. uh, but you know, you, you can see how the stone changed shape over hundreds of years. So to see a stone of that size, uh, losing, uh, you know, a quarter of its girth, uh, if you want, then I can quite imagine that, uh, mm. that people must've been knocking bits off Stonehenge for thousands of years <laughs> doesn't surprise me at all yeah I'm with mm. Sue Butler on 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 this one I think she's referring to we were talking about the pits around uh, the big pits around Dorrington Wall she says Auroch pits mm. <laughs> yeah I'm yeah. um, uh, absolutely with that one yeah uh, 
Just one moment, yes. Uh, Archaeoastronomy database. Aren't there massive post pits near the coach parking area as well? Uh, yes, they are. They um, they date <coughs> much more closely to the stuff at uh, Blick Mead, though, to the uh, uh, Mesolithic, to mm. 8,000 years ago. And nothing um, uh, can't be really be deemed to be anything to do with the Stonehenge we know. And the interesting thing about those, pit, uh, those pits, the four massive... Um, massive um, um, post holes uh, in the ground is that nobody extended that, uh, as far as I can see, the excavation was not extended. I mean, um, the reason that was an ex excavation in the first place because they were digging the car park up um, or putting the car park in. I can't remember which one it is now. Um, but there was no extension of that uh, digging to see if that line of pits extended anywhere. So um, difficult to know. Uh, sorry, digressed slightly there. But I think um, that is, that's not answered that question as best as we can, Dale. Um, yeah. Thanks I, for the I, question. I, just, uh, I, I want to answer, Lynn's made a, a, a nice comment which is an easy mistake to make. And that's, uh, Lynn says, hence chipping Norton. <laughs> and, uh, and I so wish that was true. But in actual no, Chipping fact, Norton the, is, uh, a, is a town the, the uh, in the, chipping. sorry, chipping, chipping Norton is a town in the Cotswolds, very near to uh, the Roll Wright Stones, yeah. for those that don't know. Um, but uh, chipping, there's, there's various uh, places called chipping something, chipping Sobbury. And, uh, you know, but chipping is actually an old word for a market. Yeah. Uh, uh, so it means it's a market town, um, yeah. which is not half as evocative, but there you go. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Okay, this is the last question that we have. And Andy snook this one at the last moment uh, late this afternoon. Um, so, yeah, Andy's talking about um, um, Antlopix and saying no doubting that they were used but surely a much quicker way to excavate henges and other earthworks would be to use a pole, maybe heat-tempered on the end, much like a crowbar is used for holding it today. I, I apologise, Andy, I compressed your question uh, just a, a little bit, but I think that's the essence of it. Um, and you went on to say that um, uh, antler picks, uh, antlers are perhaps a little bit flimsy for, for doing the job. Um, <laughs> Yeah. yeah. Um, well, I, I think the first thing to pick up on there is you, you, you can't imagine how hard an antler pick is. <laughs> they're, they're in fact, do you know what? It's amazing that we don't still use them today. Uh, antler picks are just, they're unbelievably tough and uh, uh, yeah, not flimsy at all. Sorry, uh, we made the mistake of equally. taking Lynn seriously. Sorry, sorry, but apologies, apologies, <laughs> Lynn. <laughs> Uh, but yeah. equally, it, it's a it's a very good point that you make, and uh, and and I don't think, you know, nobody's ever suggested that um, that posts and leverage weren't used. Uh, it's simply that you you can't say you know they haven't been found because as um, you know as you'd guess. <laughs> The, the well, well, just... as Andy himself pointed out in this question that I'm I'm afraid I truncated, yeah. Uh, so what about wood rotting away? Yeah, yeah. You know that uh, the, the the thing is that when they've done excavations, antler picks are just everywhere. Um, but that doesn't mean at all that they weren't using whatever other means at their disposal to move larger amounts of rock at any one time. Um, uh, I I think you know you you know for anyone who's done any gardening, you know that uh, that just you know heaving a pickaxe into the ground. Uh, sometimes that if, if the ground is too hard that uh, using a wooden post isn't going to help you at all there you need the pick an antler pick is going to nibble away um, uh, but it, but if you can get something into the ground then I think uh, poles and leverage absolutely would have been uh, the thing to do uh, I, you know we I can only agree with you that mm. um, as you say, you uh, you quoted Carl Sagan there that uh, um, absence of evidence isn't evidence of absence. Uh, mm. Absolutely, yeah. they probably did. And that's the thing with archaeology: we get what we're given. 
<laughs> and it ain't by no, any means mm. the whole story. Mm. And it's it's great. Repeat the uh, lateral thinking thing that, you, that we com, uh, concocted for standing with stones uh, when you're at um, is it Achnebrek? No, what am I talking about? The the uh, what? Kill Martin Glen. Kill Martin Glen. Yeah. When we when, when we were at Templewood, you mean? Templewood. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. If anybody's yeah, familiar, Mike and I were playing playing mind we games really, and we made the analogy in Standing with Stones that uh, uh, that you know I imagine that uh, that uh, you come along uh, well, you build a snowman. Somebody builds a snowman, and it's a classic snowman with a carrot for his nose and two lumps of coal for his eyes, um, and then the snowman melts. And all you've got left on the ground is the carrot and two lumps of coal. Um, and uh, and then supposing then you come along uh, however long in the future and you have no knowledge of the tradition of making snowmen and all you find on the ground is a carrot and two lumps of coal. What's your interpretation of that? And then if you extend that, that uh, so, actually a donkey's come along and eaten the carrot and there's just two lumps of coal. Well, what do you make of that? Even if you yeah, did that, know about the making of a snowman, you wouldn't just look at two lumps of coal and think, oh, that was probably once a snowman. <laughs> you know, it's that that's the thing about archaeology. That well, prehistoric archaeology, yes. Yeah, that's prehistoric archaeology. Yeah. Where there's you know, no correlation. You, you, yeah. you get what you're given. And uh, and that that's why honesty is so important, that uh, you have to say, this is what we've got, and uh, and this is our interpretation Huh. Uh, which may or may not be true. true. You, know, you, you you can't state something as fact. You can only state something as possibility, unless huh. it's a fact. We found two yeah. lumps of coal. That's as much as we can say for sure. What um, are you tittering? Oh, the, the old thing of... Uh, I, I thought it was a, a good idea at the time. I don't know what I was tittering about. Who knows? I'll never know. <laughs> um, That's fair. Uh, appreciate it, Bubba. Um Bubba asks, sound when when are these done? Uh, well, this is live, obviously. Um, I'm in uh, Warwickshire, um, not far from Stratford upon Avon. Rupert is uh, down in the south of France. Um, uh, yeah. I, I am. I'm. Uh, I'm. I'm 50 miles, roughly, north of the Pyrenees. Yeah. So I'm. Um, I'm. Yeah, a long way down. Uh, down the south of France. Seeing uh, as you did ask, Bubba, I'm going to give the whole uh, spiel here because. Uh, we do uh, this Q&A uh, every first, second Thursday of the month. I know this isn't the second Thursday of, of uh, March is because things got pushed back at the end, but next month we'll be back till, I don't know what the exact date, but the second Thursday uh, in March. Uh, we make films, uh, we make uh, podcasts and, uh, and other programmes. And we have a Patreon page, and the, our uh, Patreon fans, a lot of the people you see in the, in the chat here are uh, Patreon members, and uh, uh, help support us uh, doing that, and there's more stuff available, exclusive stuff available to our Patreon uh, fans, ad-free stuff. Um, uh, and oh, there was something else I was going to add to that. Oh, yes, and there's a regular um, monthly... Zoom chat that we have with all our Patreon um, fans as well, which happens on the first first Thursday in the month. Yes. Okay. First, first Thursday of the month, Patreon, and yeah. second Thursday of the month, Q&A. Uh, yeah. um, so, Bubba and anybody else um, asking, uh, so for the Q&A, uh, what happens oh, yeah. is, um, uh, so after t um, probably in about a week's time, if you go to the community tab on the YouTube page, on our channel page, uh, there, there's a list of tabs there. You click on the community tab, and that's where we put up the call for questions uh, for the next Q&A show. Uh, mm -hmm. So, yeah, as I said, I'll put that up in about a week's time. And you just put your question in the comments underneath, yeah. and, uh, uh and and we, we will wade through them on the next show. And of course, if you subscribe not to get notifications, you'll get notification of that uh, that going going up. Yeah, mm. um, yeah. So, 
Well, with that, uh, I think it's time to say goodbye. What? We've been going for an hour and 45 minutes, would you believe? The time does fly. Yes. Ah, did I pass my exams? But it's felt like, like I said, cramming for exams. <laughs> Do I pass? <laughs> <laughs> well, thanks ever so much for watching, folks. And, yeah. um, and really, uh, and thanks for your questions. And, and thanks for being so jolly in the chat and stuff. Yeah. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. Uh, so sorry if we've missed any uh, oh, um, yeah. uh, any exciting comments. I mean, it, so often you know you you put great comments up in the thing and they just fly by so quickly that uh, that we mm. just can't see them all and <laughs> and talk to you at the same time. <laughs> Do try, um, right. yeah, yeah, Bubba. At some point, you're going to have to tell me more about your ant the peace pipe. That must have been a piece of work. <laughs> Amazing, nice one, nice yeah. one. See you all again soon, folks. I hope. Take good care, Don't forget folks. Don't to like and subscribe. Yeah, see you later. Bye-bye. See ya. Bye.